Okay, let's make a start. Um, my name's Joe Casewell and I'm a Programme Director here at the Institute for Government and delighted to welcome you here this evening for our event on the Smart Estate. Um, a few housekeeping bits and pieces before we go any further. Um, first of all, there is no fire alarm today, so if the alarm does go off, please follow um, us outside the way you came in down the stairs. Um, and secondly, we very much hope that you'll be tweeting and the hashtag is up on the screen, it's SR2015. So, um, clearly the context of the event this evening is that we are now four weeks away from the spending review um, and the government has said that it needs um, to balance the budget by 2020 and this means clearly that spending is going to have to be reduced. And we know that some departments are looking at having to make savings of between 25 and 40 per cent and we understand that some departments may be looking at even larger reductions. And clearly, in the context of the tax credits debate that's gone on this week, this may become even more difficult. But meanwhile, the Prime Minister has recently spoken about developing a smarter state so we can deliver not just better value for taxpayers, but better services too. And he mentioned in passing that there were going to be some difficult decisions, but didn't dwell on what those would involve. And instead, he spent much of the time discussing the three principles that he saw as key to underpinning the smart estate. So those are reform, devolution and efficiency. And we're hoping that um, this evening's event um, and our panel are going to explore these themes. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. So first of all, um, to Paul Goodman, who is the MP for Wickham from 2001 to 2010 during which time he was Shadow Minister for the Department of Communities and Local Government, and he's now the Executive Editor of the influential website Conservative Home. Um, secondly, Sir Peter Housden, who was until recently Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government. Peter began his career as a teacher, then becoming a local education authority official, and subsequently Chief Executive of Nottinghamshire County Council. And he then moved to the Department for Education, became Permanent Secretary at the Department for Communities and Local Government. And last but very means not least is my colleague Daniel Thornton, who is also a Programme Director here at the Institute, uh, where he leads our work um, on the civil service. And Daniel has worked at the Foreign Office, the Treasury, Number 10, and there's definitely a CLG theme to tonight's panel because he was also a Director at CLG. And most recently, he's been at Gavi, which funds immunisation in developing countries. And he's currently working on the Institute's report on the 2015 spending review, which will be out in two weeks' time. So the format for tonight's event is that we've asked our panellists to just speak each for five minutes to leave us with plenty of time for discussion. And I shall be brutal in asking them to pull their remarks to a close after five minutes. Um, so I'm going to hand over, first of all, to kick us off to Paul. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Joe. I'll try not to incur your brutality <laughs> in any way and be very brief. Um, and make two cautionary remarks uh, right at the start. The first is that uh, I've been away for four days, so I feel rather unsighted about some of this week's traumatic events in the Commons and the Lords. Um, but second and more generally, um, I always think there's a danger, um, which I'm sure we won't fall into, of discussions of this kind becoming rather abstracted. Uh, and so we consider the small estate without looking at the political reality. Um, and let me explain what I mean in this way. Um, if we were here at this time after the last general election, we now might be having a very detailed discussion about the big society, which was all the rage then, but as you remember, it was very soon jettisoned as a guiding idea, although I still think it's around a, a quite a bit in practice. So uh, that's a sort of warning, um, cautionary note. And the political context, uh, as I see it, is is this. Uh, when I was asked to prepare for this evening, um, uh, I read Peter Riddell's piece uh, on this theme on, on our site, Conservative Home, and he pointed out the Prime Minister made a speech on uh, the smart state on September the 11th, and it didn't necessarily marry up with um, his conference speech, where the phrase wasn't mentioned at all. Now, uh, I think the political context one has to look um, to is this, regardless of what happens in the spending review. One, uh, the Prime Minister has said he will be off by 2020. Two, uh, his energies are going to an increasing degree be concentrated on the EU referendum. Finally, uh, therefore, more and more, George Osborne, for all his difficulties this week, will, I expect, be operating as a kind of co-Prime Minister. So in dashing very quickly through reform, devolution and efficiency, I'm really going to be asking myself, 
what does the Chancellor think about these and presume he will be um, the big player in, in at least the next few years ahead. Just very quickly on reform. Um, David Cameron's speech on September the 11th stressed two things. One was prison reform, the other was troubled families and children in care. This, in a way, for me, is the most kind of interesting uh, way uh, of lining the speech up with, with what George Osborne thinks, as I don't uh, think we know very much about what the Chancellor thinks about reform. We know he's very keen on finding savings from welfare reform, but we know very, very little um, about his view on public service reform more generally in this way. Um, my experience of him, and I was in his team for, for four years, is he's very, very shy of anything to do with social policy and families policy. This is a very, very big element in the Prime Minister's speech. So, as time goes on, I'll be interested to see if this is an area into which he wants to delve. Quickly on devolution, well, um, we know he's very keen on that with the Northern Powerhouse and so on in England. What we don't really know a lot about, which you and I were discussing just before this event started, is what this all means in terms of money and power and how it is all going to end up and whether there's going to be sort of more here um, when the dust settles than a kind of savings exercise for the Treasury, which would be the bleak view, and you know the more positive view will be you will have a real flowering of local power and initiative and powerful city mayors pulling everything together. Uh, on efficiency, this will clearly be the element that's most on his mind uh, in the run-up to the spending review. I gather Matthew Hancock was here earlier this week suggesting yes. that the digital program uh, would enable millions of pounds of savings perhaps to be found. Um, in my eyebrows twitch as I regard this as a bit on the optimistic side if this is regarded as a kind of casual solution for the spending review. But clearly um, Osborne is going to be following that with, with some interest. I don't think it's any secret that Francis Maud um, wouldn't have minded staying on for this spending review and in a way rather hope that his bit of the Cabinet Office might um, take over or have a big say in the Treasury. Instead, what seems to have happened more predictably is the Treasury has ended up running the Cabinet Office in the form of Matthew Hancock. And I think you know, Matthew is, is there very much to work with Osborne and um, see the plan through. Just finally, um, if we had sat here at the start of the last Parliament and you had told me or I had told you that we would get through what the IFS has described as one of the biggest spending scale backs in 60 years without massive strikes, uh, without huge social protest, and with public service satisfaction rates in some services being very high, well, I'm not sure you'd have believed me or I would have necessarily believed you. But we have got there. It may happen this time round, but if I was being cautionary, I would remind everyone that lightning doesn't strike twice. And there I'll stop. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Peter. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, three things. Firstly, I think th the Prime Minister is to be congratulated on making a speech setting out his and the government's ideas in this way. He's following a tradition, because Prime Minister Brown and Prime Minister Blair did the same thing. I think people in government find this very helpful, uh, because you can be um, deep in the uh, gunnels of a particular reform program or department, and it's very good to see actually what the whole centre of government picture is like. And I also think it aids accountability. You can have conversations like this. So there's a, I think that's a, a good thing to do. Um, what I wanted to do second was just to uh, run these ideas past um, the real and pressing circumstance of health and social care in our communities. I think that must be a premium issue for any spending review or any person who wants to live in a civilised society. And uh, what you've got there at the moment, if you think about the position, for example, uh, of an elderly woman living on her own with significant needs, she's likely to face an environment of time-bound interventions by services. So people will be coming to her for gobbits of time a day, sometimes infamously as short as 15 minutes, but she'll have timed interventions. She's likely also to have quite a high turnover of people coming to work with her. Um, because of the high turnover rates that employers, both public and private, experience in the uh, care sector. She's also likely, if not consistently, to face uh, poor coordination of those services on the ground. And to find that, quite apart from coordination, 
there is an overall shortage of effective facilities in the community. So highly pressurised GPs, absence of day clinics and day care facilities uh, would be a common tale. And thereby she's much more likely to be at risk of unplanned admission to hospital and then that unvirtuous circle is set up of overfilled uh, A&E departments, uh, beds being blocked uh, and all of the issues and difficulties that the health service in the UK uh, is wrestling with uh, at the moment. What does her situation need? Well, it needs structural reform for a start. So health and social care partnerships at local level that weld together the statutory bodies responsible for the different aspects of service. Uh, it needs, to my, in my judgment, um, stronger regulation and workforce reform actually to get that uh, established as a profession that our sons and daughters would like to go and work in uh, with career ladders, progression opportunities, uh, decent salaries, the opportunity to develop your career. And it also needs revenue and capital investment. Uh, capital investment for the facilities, revenue to run them, uh, also the, the amounts of money that local authorities pay into uh, care homes, the basic grade uh, care home for people who are unable to supplement the, uh, uh, the uh, provision uh, is inadequate, this is private sector testimony, uh, to actually run a viable business. So there's probably also a new business model required here. For, so to move from time-bound interventions into the more self-directed care in the jargon where people have got a budget or however it's done, have got more say and feel over what they do. But my main point here is that what this really needs is staff, empowered frontline staff, to make a difference on the ground, to improvise, to make decisions on the spot that will help that person uh, have their <coughs> needs met and not have to go up bureaucratic uh, triplicate forms to seek permission and approval. It's a whole workforce culture which needs different kinds of leaders uh, are, are on the ground. And I think if I were, perish the thought, contributing to a speech of the kind that the Prime Minister gave, I would have given much more emphasis to the role and in significance of frontline staff and the kind of organisations and leadership that makes their work uh, possible. Finally, just a quick word about uh, devolution. Um, this, I have never seen devolution given such a strong prominence uh, in a government uh, programme. John Healy was here. He and I were um, worked together on earlier chapters uh, of this story. But this has now moved much more centre stage with Manchester and now appearing in this sort of speech. Um, just to say, obviously, it is very difficult to get the incentives for local actors right uh, and to manage the structures. And it's the interfaces that cause the problem. So transport, of course, connects place A with place B. So somebody has to have the responsibility for the system as a whole, regardless of the particular municipality who might be making decisions, in this case in the northwest, how that connects to wider things will be properly a matter of national uh, decision and interface, getting those things right. And our, our, my previous experience in Scotland also shows that those are key issues in fiscal policy. So if you're giving much more significant local discretion, how that fits in with the overall economic personality and stance of the UK as a whole became, becomes very important. And lastly, to say that there will be, on devolution, big issues about the Whitehall capability and mindset. This is quite countercultural and challenging for an essentially federated, segregated uh, uh, pattern of government here. It poses real challenges about shared sovereignty in a way that uh, departments are unused to dealing with other jurisdictions over. It'll be a long haul and in my judgment it will require a strong, consistent political and official sponsorship to affect that change of culture uh, that will make a success of devolution. Great, thank you Peter. Daniel. Thanks Joe. and good, good evening everybody. Um, like Paul, I'm going to start with the Chancellor's words. Um, uh, before the drama of this week, uh, he said uh, that the spending review uh, would allow government to deliver more with less. Um, I mean, it's certainly clear that there will be less, um, uh, and indeed managing with less is the title of the report that will be coming out in a couple of weeks uh, that uh, is looking at all these issues. A quick plug there. Um, so if the government meets its spending targets in 2020, um, and um, last time 
Uh, the figures were issued, uh, the government was looking for a 10 billion surplus in 2020, although that, of course that might move. Um, that, if they hit those targets, that will mean uh, there will have been a decade of spending reductions. Um, and that is actually, that's unprecedented. Um, uh, although it must be said that the previous decade saw a steady growth in, uh, in spending, uh, which itself was, uh, hadn't been seen until, uh, since the uh, swinging 60s, uh, which some of you will remember better than me. Um, it's also the case, I think, as we, um, uh, as we look at the next five years, um, that the pattern of spending reductions will continue to be uneven. Um, so spending on the NHS will be protected, pensions, there's a triple lock which has a big, big impact, school spending, defence and overseas development. Um, and that means there's a there'll be a concentration of impact of the spending reductions that need to be seen um, on other areas of welfare, and obviously tax credits included within that, police and fire services, courts and prisons, childcare, higher and further education, uh, local services such as social care that Peter was speaking about, children's services and local transport. So those are the areas that will, will take the brunt of the spending reductions that need to be seen. Um, and I mean, in, in a way, Paul is of course right, it is remarkable that reductions have been, that the scale of the reductions we've already seen, um, uh, but uh, I, think, I think it's harder this time round than it was in 2010, um, because when ministers came into government in 2010, uh, they saw lots of things they didn't like, um, they, they got rid of regional development agencies and a lot of the money that was associated with them, these agencies that used to preoccupy Peter and me and, and indeed John Healy in the back row. Um, uh, so um, there haven't been those transitions this time round uh, between uh, you know, Labour administration and uh, the coalition, except in the case of DEC and BIS, um, where you have had transitions between Liberal Democrat uh, Secretaries of State and, and Conservative Secretaries of State. And it's also clear that Michael Gove um, is taking a hard look at, at justice and we've seen some, some sort of announcements of, uh, of some radical thinking there. The other thing that was different in 2010 was that there was an economic crisis that um, you know, helped to justify the spending reductions. And although we've still got a deficit of 5% of GDP, 90 billion pounds, um, there isn't the same sense of economic crisis. So, um, as Joe said at the beginning, um, you know, the, the Prime Minister referred to difficult decisions and it's clear there will have to be some difficult decisions. And to take those difficult decisions, ideally there's a prioritisation exercise and you protect the things that you care about most and you focus your reductions on the other things. Um, John Manzoni, the Chief Executive of the Civil Service, has kind of driven a process of establishing single departmental plans in each department, uh, which lists the the priorities uh, for the department and the resources against those priorities. This is an entirely sensible effort. Um, we hope it works better than the previous attempts to, to do this sort of thing, um, which have not really stuck. Um, and I think um, you know this is going to be a very challenging exercise, and we're hearing from departments that it is indeed a very challenging exercise. The manifesto commitments um, amount to separately 517 uh, commitments for central government and the single departmental plans need in some way to refer to or include uh, those commitments. And it's not only the manifesto commitments, but also essential continuing de departmental business, which didn't get at attention in the manifestos. So, uh, you know, there is a risk that departments end up with a kind of Christmas tree of manifesto commitments uh, and, you know, other things that need to be done. Uh, and, and that they don't end up with focus lists that allow them to really prioritise. So that's, that's one of the risks we're, we're seeing. It's exacerbated by the fact that some of the government's targets are, um, you know, stretching would be, would be a polite word. So, um, you know, the UK is supposed to be doubling uh, its exports by 2020. Uh, we haven't made much progress on that target so far. China did double its exports between 2005 and 2010. Um, but, you know, we're not rapidly industrializing uh, in the UK, um, and so it's pretty unlikely that we're going to see that turnaround. So, you know, de departments that have got to wrestle with unrealistic targets have to either disregard the targets or produce plans that, you know, don't really connect with reality. Um, I'll next touch briefly on, on uh, digital government, which, as has been mentioned, which is, is one of the sort of big themes of the, of the spending review. Um, the PM has said that he wants to go much further in making government digital, saving money and improving services at the same time. 
And you know, I've recently returned to the UK uh, after five years, and just very anecdotally, I, I have seen a lot of improvement in the services uh, that are offered, offered digitally. Slightly more evidence-based uh, uh, surveys. Uh, there's one done by the EU uh, that uh, does mystery shopping across EU uh, services. And that's shown that the UK is about average in terms of the EU, um, uh, in terms of the services that are offered. So, you know, some, we're in a reasonable position, but there's plenty of ground to be made up in terms of what's been achieved so far. And as um, uh, Paul was saying, uh, Matt Hancock has, has set out a kind of radical vision of, of what digital uh, government can do. He talked about a new model of government. So we've got this, on the one hand, you know, quite ambitious um, uh, rhetoric about, about what can be done. But on the other hand, you've got um, the major projects authority, which uh, sits in the cabinet office and looks at all of the major projects across government. Um, and they've, uh, their assessment is that there are, there are at least 27 uh, of the digital major projects that are amber red, and that means that there's a serious doubt about whether the project's going to work or not. So, um, you know, on the one hand, you've got this great ambition. On the other hand, in terms of what's been done until now and some of the risks in the system that the government itself assesses, um, you know, things are looking, uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty challenging. So we're going to take a look at this area in the next few months as well. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's clear if you read the headlines this morning, the, the chief executive of Deutsche Bank was saying he was going to, you know, tear up the whole IT system of the bank and start again. You know, digital uh, change is challenging for every organisation. It's not just for government. Um, but I think gov while government has increased the capacity it's got available to manage digital projects, um, there has also been there's some uncertainty about that with the departure of the, the leadership of the government digital service. Um, so I think you, need, you definitely need a strong centre to set standards in this area um, uh, without micromanaging uh, all of the processes. So, you know, we want to help uh, government uh, get to Estonia or beyond uh, Estonia being at, the, um, being at the upper end of the EU averages. Um, so, um, yeah, um, we're, we're very keen to embark on this agenda with the government. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm going to take Chair's prerogative to ask a couple of initial questions. We've roamed across a lot of very helpful territory there. Um, and Paul, I just wanted to start with you because you talked about how in some ways it's surprising that um, satisfaction amongst the public has held up despite cuts in terms of satisfaction with public services. And some of the work that we've done here at the Institute looking at public service markets has shown that that's an area that the public is, is slightly less kind of, um, we're slightly more worried about, I think it's fair to say, in terms of the marketisation of services. So what role do you think markets should play in a smarter state and what more can government do to kind of allay some of the concerns that the public have? Of course, I mean, the market principle has been slowly working its way into public services for a very, very long time. Um, in a way, the first big Thatcher reforms of the health service under Clark, you have an internal market. Um, and then under Blair, um, uh, you know, the internal market was sort of first put on the back foot and then sort of brought, brought back again. Uh, I think it is the public who are intrinsically very suspicious of markets simply because they believe someone is going to come in and make a profit at their expense. Uh, I remember um, when I was in the shadow treasury team, shadowing John Healy, as a matter of fact, there at the back of the room. Um, George Oswald for a while had this soundbite about Gordon Brown being a robot to reform, and after a while he dropped it. And the reason he dropped it was he found the public didn't like the word reform. You know, reform suggested that someone was going to come in and actually make public services w w worse, so he you know, had to try and find a way around it. So you know, I think the task of sort of persuading the public that reform will mean better services delivered for less money is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. I, I don't have any easy, immediate answer to it. And I think, you know, John Osborne will be sailing against a headwind when he tries to persuade people he can do that in the autumn state. Yeah, thank you. Um, Peter, I had a question um, based on, you were talking quite a lot about health and social care. Mm. Um, and given that that's going to be, um, we think, an increasing part of the devolution deals that have been happening across England, certainly it's a key part of the Manchester deal. Mm. Are there any interesting lessons from the Scotland experience in terms of health and social care that people should be applying in those devolution deals? Well, I think we're probably at the same uh, point in this, Joe. The government in Scotland has um, brought into being statutory partnerships in each local authority area, which are in preparation now and will go live in March. So there's some very intense work going on. And I, I, 
the point of my comments really was to understand that of course the governance structures, the funding arrangements, the business models are absolutely vital, but they're not sufficient. At any tick of the clock, these arrangements will be need to make to work uh, in a local area, in a particular district. And Paul's point is about the big society, whatever you call it. That is people, frontline workers, as well as voluntary organisations and carers and families, making these arrangements work. And my point is that if you're involved in the state, whether at local or national level, there's a particular form of engagement and leadership that makes it more or less likely that those people there doing that feel supported and engaged. They have the tools to do the job or not. The worst position you get into, I think, is if the state subsumes all of that and says, no, this is our responsibility, go away, we can handle it. But it's a much trickier thing to provide uh, the right format and engagements. And that's what those partnerships up there are going to do. Mm -hmm. And I think this last point goes straight back into civil service capability. Because I think it's a different thing to actually be designing a system that will encourage and engender that sort of thing, just as it's a different thing in a local authority. So it needs a particular set of skills and training, which would be out with our, our current curricula uh, for uh, a modern civil servant. Great, thank you. Um, I'm now going to invite questions from the floor. Um, we have got some roving mics, so please do wait for the microphone, please, before speaking, because we are recording this. Um, and please say your name and organisation and keep your comments brief if possible. So who would like to kick us off? Over here, please. Thank you. It's Adrian Brown from the Centre for Public Impact. I'll pick up on something that, that Daniel said, but this is for the panel as a whole. Daniel, you said that within the spending review, would there be more money spent on the things or the things that they like would be protected and the things that they didn't like would have less money spent on them. But if the smartest state means anything, shouldn't we be led by the evidence of what works and what's effective and be focusing on those things and, and taking resources away from things that are less effective? And I didn't hear a lot about evidence or the use of uh, uh, a focus on outcomes from any of the panels. So to what extent do you think government is smart in the sense that it focuses on what actually works? And if there's a gap, how can we close it? Daniel? So um, you're right, I didn't talk about that, and I probably should have done, um, although I think there's a, you know, a lot of outcomes uh, are affected by digital government. Um, I mean, I think... Um, you know, the, the, the process of, of selecting priorities isn't necessarily driven by uh, careful study of, of evidence and outcomes. Um, I think one of the uh, issues, if you, <coughs> I mean, it's close to what, what Peter was saying, if you look at um, Simon Stevens' um, five-year forward plan for, for the NHS, for NHS England, um, he's very clear that he can, he can make efficiencies in the NHS, but he's depending on uh, social care and he's depending on um, uh, prevention. Um, so the summer budget took a chunk out of prevention and the ring fence comes off in 2016 um, and I wouldn't be surprised if some local authorities decided to spend money on potholes and not um, health prevention. Um, <coughs> and social care has seen some of the biggest cuts of any area so the kind of circulation that, that Peter was talking about is a real problem for the NHS. So you know, the, the kind of protection that's been provided to, to the NHS isn't really um, supported by, you know, if you read the plan, it doesn't, it doesn't feel all that protected. So, you know, the prioritisation, in a way, needs to be for kind of groups of issues, not, um, I would say, not, um, not in an institution or a set of institutions like the NHS. That would be one, one issue, I think. I mean, clearly there are many others. Mm -hmm. Peter, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, well, Adrian, I think that the, if you take um, health and social care to continue the line of discussion there, um, telehealth is a really powerful uh, arena now where uh, people, vulnerable people in their own home settings are able to use a variety of um, active and passive uh, technology-enabled devices to have more control over their lives and also to be safer uh, in those environments. But I think that the, the history of public services reform shows that any piece of technology, whether it's IP or actually a piece of kit, uh, uh, it's the context that determines whether it will really make a difference. And my point, I think, is being those contexts are not magical. They don't materialise out of thin air. They're made by men and women creating the environments. 
And a lot of these are about the warmth of human contact. They're about befriending services. They're about the right kind of home care support in which that kind of technology can help you uh, move forward. So this is, doesn't feel like a magic button, but it's government asking itself nationally and locally, how do we create the context where those kinds of technological advances can work? And I think th then you can take a proper measured view about the evidence about what they can do and what they can't. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah, uh, my name is microphone. Thank you. My name is uh, Jonathan Bland. Uh, uh, I run Social Business International and a network called E3M, which brings together the leaders of a group of social businesses that trade in public service markets. Quite a few of them have spun out of the public sector, some quite a while ago, some linked to the more recent mutuals program. And I think they're doing one of those things that you were talking about, um, Peter, about empowering staff to do things in different ways and coming up with new models for doing things. This was a big kind of thing that Francis Maud was trying to push in the last government. Mm -hmm. um, and he made a big thing, we're going to have a million public service workers moving out into public service mutuals or social businesses, which didn't happen. Um, we've got about 100, I suppose, um, doing some brilliant things. The people I work with probably turn over a, a billion pounds in the kind of service areas that they, they work in. Um, but. Do you think that this new government will actually really harness the power that there is to do things differently and get behind this? I think it was in the manifesto, but there isn't anybody running it in the cabinet office. All the staff who all were working on it have all seemed to have gone. Uh, I just wondered, you know, from your point of view, how much you see this as being important for the, the government and the context of the, the smart estate. Mm -hmm. Who would like to pick up on that? Just one point actually relates to Adrian's question from, from before. Uh, I didn't know that detail about no one giving the mutuals element of push at the, at the centre. But actually, it does relate to Adrian's question in a way because if I understood it rightly, it was about government making the best decisions on the evidence um, to get the best results. Actually, if I remember rightly, at one point, um, please anyone here with better knowledge correct me if I'm wrong, Francis Moore actually introduced a prize um, at one point for, 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 for the best radical idea that didn't work. Um, because he, he believed that, uh, obviously, unless you tested ideas that didn't work, you weren't going to find the ones, the ones that do. So you know, there is a, a sort of trade-off um, here between finding ideas that work uh, and government taking a punt and making a risk and sometimes losing some money in order to find what doesn't work and what does work. And well, just a final thought, going back to Adrian's question, um, and it's a question in itself, how do you know what delivers in a settlement where much more is devolved on what may work well in one area may not work at all well in another. Well, certainly Mayor Bloomberg in New York was famous for taking people out to lunch um, when a project they tested failed. So it was yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. make risk much more kind of acceptable. Yep. Mm. Does anyone want to pick up on the mutuals point? Just two sentences, Jonathan. So I completely agree with you. I've <coughs> no basis to form a view about what might happen. Uh, in the period ahead, but I think the thing that your point brings to this is the same as the devolution piece, really. It's how do you release energy in the system? And I, I know a, an adult education uh, mutual in West Sussex that was spun out of the council there, and the energy that created in that environment to solve problems that hitherto had seemed completely insoluble was just a job. So more of that, I think, would be a, a really good thing everywhere. Okay, and then we had um, a question over there, and if you are sitting in the room next door, please do come through to ask a question. Hello, question from the antechamber. Um, <laughs> I wonder to what degree does a smarter state require reforms to deliver public services across dep departmental boundaries uh, rather than principally within them? There are many public services, for example, at the border that involve dozens of agencies, but principally our accountability and our organization is within departmental silos rather than across them. Do we require a reform there? And can you just say your name and organization? Uh, Richard Sargent from the Civil Service. Who would like to pick up on that point? I think, I mean, yes, you're clearly right that many, many uh, uh, improvements need to go across. It's very hard to, <laughs> when you're poking, poking around the door. Um, um, uh, many improvements need to go across uh, departmental and agency boundaries and if you're a user of public services it's very frustrating to have to go between to one agency and then go to another once you prove something with, with the other agency that happens all the time I mean if you're looking at you know 
big improvements in the way the criminal justice system works. You have to see better kind of uh, management of data between the police, the courts, the prisons, um, and you know that's clearly challenging um, because they're agencies with very different bases. But um, you know I think that's that's what the government has to drive. Um, I, I mean I think silos get kind of blamed for everything, and I think um, it's. It, it is good to have clear accountability for spending public money. Um, the alternative to clear accountability for spending public money is, you know, public money not being spent very well or disappearing or, or whatever. So uh, I think there is a constant tension. And I think um, it's easy to say get rid of the silos and do everything on a cross departmental basis or you know, merge organizations. You can't actually deal with all the different life events that people will have. Um, by creating a sort of mega organization uh, that, that you know deals with the whole criminal justice system so I think you know there's a kind of there's, there are trade-offs here it, it very much comes to life uh, in the in the digital government um, agenda because um, you know you you have the ability uh, with digital services to, to join up these discrete um, uh, operations between agencies but doing so is is, is very challenging um, and you know maybe you need to move some institutional boundaries around, and I think that's one of the big questions for the next five years. Great, thank you. Um, there's one over there, and then one over here. Let's take this one first, please. Hi, it's um, Clive Bates from Counterfactual. I used to work for the Welsh government a while back. Um, the phrase um, "more for less" is banded around a lot, but shouldn't shouldn't they think about less for a lot less? Um, and shouldn't they redefine the scope of the state to do fewer things? and actually stop doing things as government, rather than try to sweat the assets with an efficiency program to try and do what's always been done with fewer and fewer resources. And is the government sort of bold enough about stopping doing things? And I'm thinking about, um, say, indus industrial policy or uh, you know, the prohibition of drugs, which is very expensive in the criminal justice system, the amount of spending that goes into end-of-life uh, care, um, all of the money that goes into agriculture and so on. Um, is it good at actually stopping stuff, and should that be a focus uh, for its uh, the smarter state, stop doing stupid things? Paul, would you like to comment on that? <coughs> sort of yes, comma, but, full stop. <laughs> if you just sort of go through the examples you've given, um, you know, quite good examples maybe of what the state should or shouldn't do. Um, industrial policy, maybe. Um, drugs prohibition, well, um, you know, you're right in the middle of a very political argument that successive governments have not wanted to grasp um, for the reason, presumably, that it just upsets too many apple carts and frightens too many horses. Um, and, you know, arguably, um, you, you, know, you, you could argue certain uh, um, uh, senior police officers, I suppose, would argue that in some areas we are on our way to sort of de facto decriminalization though not perhaps legalization so um, you know when the argument is put you know shouldn't the state do much do much 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 less I mean one you know looking at the examples that you've given they would be very very contentious in every single case second if it's put like that um, it's my I've come around to this view over a very very long period of time that it's very very unattractive language for voters um, I have never yet met any ordinary voter outside the political circles in which I've moved who ever sat down and said, but you know what, I think the state should be a lot smaller. Or, to the contrary, you know, I think the state should be a lot bigger. This is kind of not the way most people think. And I think sort of what most people want from the state is that sort of dreadful word enabler. Um, they're angry with the state where it messes up an arrangement where they think it could do better, where they interface with it in a hundred different ways a day. But if you take away the prospect of it being there, Joe, again, back yeah. to your question about what the research finds uh, about people's views if they're sort of left to markets, they get very worried by it. And, you know, finally, when I went back and I reread that speech by the, by the Prime Minister on September the 11th, you know, guess what? He'd swerve round this danger in his sort of characteristically adroit way by saying, of course, we're not seeking the smaller state per se, he said. I liked the per se. It, 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 <laughs> it lied in whether or not he actually was seeking a smaller state. But, you know, he said we're not seeking it per se. And there's certainly sort of no um, intention in Downing Street, if I can just you know, quote a phrase I've heard used there, 
great, you know, we don't want to go the full Ayn Rand, was the way it was put to me. <laughs> Daniel, did you want to come in? I don't know how to follow Ayn Rand, but, um, uh, I mean, the government did stop doing some things uh, from 2010 onwards. I mean, we've, we, we've already mentioned that the RDAs, some of the functions of the RDAs carried on, some of the programmes carried on, but a lot of the money was taken away and the institutions were closed. Um, they stopped uh, identity cards. Um, but um, you're certainly right that often it's not that clear. Um, uh, so Ken Clark tried to uh, you know, change sentencing guidelines, reduce the number of people in prison, um, which is a kind of big, big money saver uh, and may have other benefits. Um, uh, but that got stopped by a, a, a kind of um, uh, a fuss about uh, or uh, political arguments about uh, classification of rape and whether that would be covered by the new sentencing guide guidelines. So he, he, got, he got stopped in, in, in kind of trying to stop things. Um, and I think that points to one of the difficulties that we've got, which is, you know, as with the police, you can, it's easier to reduce the administrative um, structures than it is to explicitly stop something. Um, so, you know, the police may be investigating fewer crimes, but there aren't fewer crimes on the statute books. Um, the legislation lags behind the administrative reductions. And, and I think it, it's, it's, it would be sensible to think about a legislative programme that's about stopping things. And, and you know, in association with uh, the, the reductions uh, in the administration and the, and the, and the spending on, on, on public servants and civil servants. Um, because the two don't get joined up very well often. Peter. Well, yeah, I mean, it just strikes me that the interesting thing about this is, uh, alongside those big entry-exit decisions, is the state is the, a huge sponsor of innovation in public services. It must be the biggest uh, by a huge margin. Um, but the actual way it does it is often makes difficulties particularly around uh, pilot programs as it's seeking to explore new territories and new ways of doing things. Because there's, these are always massively front-loaded in terms of design, thought, engagement, and insufficient attention given to actually, well, what are we buying here, and is this going to go on forever? So if you're investing in capability, I mean, if you're a fund investing in a, a startup, you'd have a pretty good idea about how long you intended to be here and what kind of criteria you'd be using and process to govern an exit. Now, gov government's in a different space, of course, but the, the classic um, pilot programs tend to be overfunded and underdesigned, and then you have a huge row when the, the end of the term comes, and often because uh, there's been a lack of clarity that what you're building there, what you want to leave behind is capability. So you want people able to do different things than they could do before not more people spreading themselves more thickly. So I think there are matter, technical matters about design of these kind of programmes that can help government be more agile in its innovation role. Great, thank you. And there was a question over here. Just here, please. Um, Can you just take the microphone? Thanks. Oh, Robert Morland, I'm a former Conservative member of the European Parliament and a councillor on Westminster City Council and Gloucester City Council. Um, and also, um, I'm on the a partnership board of the, what was actually a, a big society creation, the Canal and Rivers Trust. Uh, and indeed, I'm hoping we will go further in, uh, we're, because we plan to take over some of the waterways that are under the control of the Environment Agency. My question is, I um, liked Paul's start at the very beginning, which he outlined our the background, and I thought that was very appropriate, but it led me on to think that really the barrier to all this is actually how the public will take it and how the public will take it electorally. And my impression is that a lot of us who have been in government, albeit in my case, only a chairman of a committees of a council, we do and we say an awful lot of things that um, are nice, that we like, uh, we think possibly certain little pockets in the constituencies like, but actually are a bundle of nothing when it comes to making any electoral result. The public have very clear, defined, important things, or don't they, 
Uh, and it's really, as I think was suggested, when occasionally something hits them. So it struck me that the end result of what you should be saying is, and the government won the election, or the Conservative Party won the election, which shows that it can appeal to the public. Do you think, actually, I'm on dangerous ground? And if I can throw in the point, too, the concern that I have is we talk of smaller being better. Are we actually really going to have a more efficient civil servant as a result of it? Thanks. Paul, do you want to kick us off? Well, an optimistic take would be to look at the devolution angle, which is the second of the three themes we were discussing. A sort of optimistic view would be you'll get reform without public resistance because in the areas to which more powers are devolved, um, you know, the Treasury will sit around the table with the local authority. And you know, to come to one of the main themes this evening, the health service, um, the health service here, you have the local authorities there doing their social service work, everything is joined up, properly funded, the efficiencies are saved, everything works much better local and everything's fine. You know, that would be an, an optimistic view. Um, but, you know, a more pessimistic one would be that we're in a very different world from 2010. You know, and I think when the coalition was formed in 2010, there was this intense focus on the deficit. There was this recognition that something had to be done. Labour had produced its own sort of plan to reduce it. The Liberal Democrats seem to have been won over during the course of the coalition negotiations to concentrating on deficit reduction and, and there was you know, a, a sense that a lot had to be done now. I would question, though no more than question, whether it's the same this year. Um, the public have been through a lot of pain. Um, we have a government with a you know, smallish majority. Uh, and I just wonder if there's a sense, both outside Parliament and in, of do we really have to go through this again? even though there's a deficit of £90 billion. Uh, and obviously I'm asking that in the light of what's happened earlier this week with tax credits. Um, and although I've been away, I have to say I came back and thought one of the real questions isn't really, is the Lords up for implementing lots of reform and public spending scale back? Actually quite a big question that emerges in the tax credit rise, is the Commons up for it? Um, there was a lot of dissent on the Conservative side. I didn't see any of that or very much in the last parliament when the housing benefit changes were um, uh, forced through. So I've given you a sort of optimistic case, but you know, I'm, I'm, I sense that the public and quite a lot of Conservative MPs are not mentally and psychologically in the same place that they were in 2010. Mm -hmm. Daniel? Perhaps on the civil, can, the, can there be a more efficient civil service? Um, so to start with, a, with an, uh, again, unsystematic anecdote, when I um, worked in DCLG uh, and I inherited uh, various uh, staff, um, one of the people who worked for me said, I asked him what he did, and he said, my job is to liaise with the Department of Work and Pensions. And I said, no, it isn't. Um, that's not a job. <laughs> uh, and we're going we're gonna to think about your role. And in fact, he um, did do some very useful things. But I think there are... You know, there's always a risk in the civil service that the, the, the bits of the civil service spend a lot of time talking to other bits of the civil service and you're not focusing on uh, your, your customers, which is uh, the public and ministers. Um, so um, I think uh, some of the challenges, though, in, in getting more efficient civil service is as, as you shrink the civil service and it's come down already from around half a million to 400,000 in the last five years, and there's been a figure banded around of maybe another 100,000 coming out over the next five years, although you know, that hasn't been confirmed. Um, as you do that, um, you've also got to, uh, the civil service is clear, I think, reinforce some of the specialisms in the civil service, so the commercial function, the digital function that I've been talking about, <coughs> financial management across the civil service. Uh, all of those things are really important, uh, particularly when spending uh, is, is, is tight. Um, so, you know, you've got to get very good people in those roles and you've got to shrink the service as a whole and the pay bill has got to go up by 1% uh, a year maximum at a time when private sector wages are growing. So, you know, that's a pretty tough... Um, you must be pleased you're not a permanent secretary anymore, Peter. Um, that's a pretty tough um, circle to square. Um, but, I, you know, I think, yes, it is possible to have a more efficient civil service, but it's, it's going to be a tough ride. Um, Julian. Uh, Julian Craig from the Institute of Government. Um, I'm listening to the Prime Minister's speech on the Smart 
the state. It was one of those classic speeches that does a tour of virtually everything that's been in policy wonk world um, sort of reform of government for quite a period. We had a bit of contestability showing up, then there was payment by results. We got quite interesting into devolution as well, which I hadn't heard before in a Prime Minister's speech, but anyone who's been around these sort of things, de decentralisation, devolution, has been on the agenda of anyone who was wish list for changing the UK state for quite some time. I'm just kind of interested, what for the panel, what for you was the most exciting thing that the Prime Minister sort of touched on that you think's got the most potential? And then a second question, what do you think the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, we sort of identified that earlier on, have put the most investment into actually overcoming the kind of barriers, political, um, institutional implementation, to actually see some real change? Which of the many things the Prime Minister outlined do you think has got the best chance of actually coming to fruition and changing the scale of the state in something like, say, privatisation did um, in the 83 <coughs> government uh, for the Conservatives? Peter, do you want to start? I, I recognise the, the picture you drew there. Um, I, I thought that's a good thing, actually, because government deals with such a huge variety of circumstances, um, and each one of those will be a very variegated system in itself. Because I think we often tend to think of health or education as being in state A or state B, whereas actually there are huge variations in performance. So the kind of approaches and tools that you can use and combine, I think, will vary enormously. So uh, I think it's the, it's the choice and deployment of those range of approaches that matter. And I, I'd, I'd be with um, uh, Daniel here, really. I think a lot of this is about uh, ambition and determination in public services, which politicians have never been short of. But I, I think in... Uh, for civil servants, for public servants in, in general, actually a, a greater sense of uh, agency, determination, responsibility uh, to make the world a better place uh, would be the motif that ought to run all the way through this. And for government um, of, of whatever stripe to actually believe in public service and public servants. So people, you are doing massively important jobs. We're here to enable you to do them. And I think the, the energy that would release in the system would be uh, a really important asset. Paul? Peter Riddell wrote for our site uh, about this speech that he didn't think it really married up with the speech the Prime Minister made at conference. I thought that was largely right, but with one exception. I thought a lot of the Prime Minister's conference speech was about social reform. And in the reform section of the speech, there were really sort of two big elements. One was prisons and the other was families. Um, to me, actually the speech was less of a tour um, of the you know, various buzzwords, ideas and phrases you might expect to find, and rather more in the reform section, anyway, two big chunks. One was prisons, which felt rather, to me, um, as though he'd recognised, well, Michael Gove's got a big programme here, so I'm gonna push it right up to the front of the speech. You know, he's doing more than Chris Grayling did in the last parliament, although Chris made a start on rehabilitation, so I'd really better make the most of it in this speech. But the other was the trouble of families element, and I think it, Cameron's always been interested in families policy. And you know, if you accept, you know, sort of view on the centre centre right and elsewhere that the three sort of building blocks to social progress are home, schools, and work, well, in the first term, Michael Gove did an enormous amount of reform on schools, and Ian Duncan Smith not so much with the universal credit, but with a lot of the smaller changes that he made to the welfare system, did a lot of work. What is left um, is, first of all, homes in terms of housing. Let's leave that aside for a minute. But then in terms of that very dangerous thing, families policy. And my sense from the speech was that, you know, the Prime Minister would really like to get into that and see if he could find mechanisms that would deliver better opportunities for kids who almost from from birth, from their very early years, a disadvantage compared to others. Now, whether he can make that work or not, I don't know, but I think that would be intrinsically a great thing to do if he can, and if George Osborne goes on to take an interest in it as he you know, extends his tentacles across government in the next couple of years. And just a last thought, um, is looking at the, you know, you ask what might be achieved, I think some of the most momentous public sector 
reform in the last part, public service reform, really was undertaken by strong ministers with strong special advisors going about what they wanted to do, um, sometimes merely cooperating with Downing Street, at other points in one or two cases, not even telling Downing Street what it was up to. This may not be a model of very good government, but curiously, by being somewhat hands-off, by being preoccupied with the business of running the coalition, Theresa May, Gove, IDS, Francis Maud, grailing with his rehabilitation up to a point, were all able to get on with it and deliver reform for which I think that government will be remembered. Daniel. So in addition to the other things the, that the other members of the panel have talked about, I think that one of the central ideas in the Smarter State speech was the sort of Schumpeterian, you know, how do you get creative destruction in government um, and, and kind of evolution um, uh, that you see in the, in the private sector. And the answer is it's very hard to get that, as we all know, um, but, <coughs> but it's worth um, thinking about how you can do it. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the coalition should have credit for, uh, you know, setting up the Behavioural Insights Unit, which tests government policies properly. I mean, in a way, you can say, well, you know, I've, I've spoken to kind of people who are operational researchers for many years, and they say, well, it's just operational research. Yeah, sure, it's just operational research, but it's operational research up in lights and getting prioritised uh, in government policy making, which is where it should be. Um, so testing is one thing, um, you know, the, the, the kind of mutuals and the, and the you know, contracting out services is another possible way to do it, but you've got to do it right. See under, you know, managing public markets, um, as we saw earlier in the week. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the kind of shock to the system that you get from constant spending reductions, um, which makes people think about what they're doing. But as I said earlier on, it may just mean you're doing, uh, you're managing with less. It may, it may not mean that you're actually being more efficient. And I think, it, you know, there is no necessary connection between uh, reductions in spending and efficiencies, even if the Treasury, from time to time, elides the two. Okay, we've got a question just over here, please. Hi, Sarah Allen from Involve. Um, I just wanted to reflect briefly on the role of public engagement in all of this. I think building on what Peter said about the importance of the local context, um, my experience, and I think sticking to the health and social care example, my experience of working in that sector locally is that public engagement um, can provide an excellent way to find out what's wrong with the service and in fact to improve the service so that it has better outcomes for, for less or the same amount of money. And that also it can be an excellent way to find out why, for example, people are going to A&E and to get right to the heart of the problem so that you can see what you can address. Um, when the devolution debate first started, um, there was quite a bit of talk about double devolution, about engaging the public and improving services on the ground after devolution. And that seems to have completely disappeared. And so I wondered what the panel's view was on the kind of opportunities and barriers for getting that back on the agenda. It's a very interesting question. And certainly Matt Hancock um, was here earlier in the week and was very much talking about involving people in the design of digital. But I think we've seen less discussion about it in terms of design and delivery of public services more generally. Who would like to um, start by picking up on that point? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I spent yesterday afternoon with a, um, a group called the Alliance for Health and Social Care in Scotland, who I think it's very often through these kind of uh, bodies that those voices are heard. So these will be uh, carers groups and voluntary organisations that are, or, if you like, organising a, a voice and advocacy. Uh, and you have a very particular uh, useful perspective on support for people with dementia uh, in a particular community, which is, you know, can be very locally determined. Uh, I think the challenge is actually to get uh, public service bodies not only engaging with those, but actually empowering those people not to deliver services, and here you come back into mutuals and those kind of issues, but actually involve them in the architecture and the design of what a system would look like that would support people uh, uh, on a journey through uh, those kind of issues. So yeah, I think there is a lot of good stuff going on there. The voluntary sector has been consistently supported by governments of every stripe right across the UK for 10, 15, 20 years now to play these roles from large charities down to small community organisations. I think there's hugely more capacity there uh, than there ever was, but I'd also think there's great potential for 
uh, that to play an even stronger part. But there is a professional challenge for public servants to actually structure organisations and individuals so that we can make the most of it. Daniel. So just a small point on what you said, which I agree with. Um, I mean, often my experience is that you get better um, consultation with the public and engagement with the public uh, in, in making decisions in statutory agencies than you do in uh, kind of mainstream government departments. <coughs> and I think that's maybe because, um, you know, politicians feel uh, that the political system is the engagement mechanism and, you know, they, 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 they're already in touch with what people want. I mean, they're always interested in finding out more. But, um, you know, you, in, if you take the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, you know, they, they, they have to ask pretty fundamental questions of the public about how uh, different health interventions are ranked. Um, and, and I think, you know, given a very difficult job, they do it very well. Um, uh, and, but you didn't get that kind of participation in those questions until that agency was set up. And in a sense, it then had space to say, okay, we're gonna you know, ask these very difficult questions. It's still very difficult for the political system to accommodate those very difficult prioritization questions. So every so, every so often you get a, you know, a new cancer fund stuck on the top of the <coughs> system. But essentially, it's, it's a good thing to do. And um, you know, uh, I think it's worth looking at where that can be done more often. Paul, did you want to pick up on that? Well, just a thought. Um, perhaps someone here knows the answer. But I'd be curious to know how many of the elected police commissioners after being elected, simply said, I have a mandate now, uh, and either sat back and, you know, tried to hold their police force to account, or joined with it in lobbying Whitehall and Westminster for more resources or both. And how many, having been elected, then went back to the people who elected them and said, so how should we be dealing with crime and antisocial behaviour in the area I've just been elected to serve? And I'd then be curious to know, whether you got better results in those areas, I bet you did. I'll probably be told the Institute's actually done a study. But it seems to be <laughs> a, a, another <laughs> you know, breaking free of health and social services for a moment. It seems to be another area in which engagement with the public would surely be very important and extremely useful. And also perhaps in the devolution deals, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out once sort of power is devolved to local areas, what kind of levels of engagement local populations are getting in the redesign of some of those services. Um, there are a few other hands up. There's um, one here, um, one here, and then one there. So can I take that one first, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, Sean Manwani from uh, Henley Business School. Uh, we're doing a lot on digital leadership and general leadership, as you'd expect. And, uh, and I guess our premise would be that if you want a smarter state, you need smarter leadership. And so I'm just interested to hear what's being done, you know, for example, to exploit the digital government, not just from an individual, but right <coughs> across the senior people and executives around, the, around government. What's being done to make sure we've got smarter leadership in this area? Daniel? So, I, I mean, I think there is a, there's a bit of a cultural struggle going on at the moment in government between, uh, you know, the kids from Shoreditch with stickers on their MacBooks uh, and beards and, you know, all the rest of it, who get digital and, um, and have a very sort of radical view about what digital can do in the world. And, um, you know, people who are, um, you know, of a different generation and, uh, you know, uh, have, have different backgrounds uh, who are, you know, running programs in white ball. Um, and I think, you know, we have to try and um, bring these, uh, these tribes together um, and first of all have a translation exercise but then ideally have each other, have each side learn uh, the respective languages. Because um, I think there were some examples of government digital service uh, not communicating and interacting particularly well with the rest of government and there were examples on the other side where the same <coughs> applied. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure if it's whether it's about being smart, but it's about, I think, you know, moving on and, um, and, and, and integrating these, these, you know, this new dynamic area of work with its new way of thinking into how government works. Okay. Can we have the question over here, please? Martin Wheatley. I'm involved in various projects on aspects of public service reform. I, I want to ask about something that's, that's popped up in conversation but not being perhaps focused on, which is prevention. 
Um, a smart state would not be s wasting money the way the British state does on tackling the immediate consequences of preventable things going wrong. Um, we see that massively in health, criminal justice, um, the welfare system. Um, what do the panel think are the prospects for this spending review enabling some really serious re-engineering of public services so they're focused on enabling people to live well, things not going wrong, uh, as opposed to spending money on picking up the pieces? Peter, can we start with you? Because I think there's some interesting examples from Scotland on prevention. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's worth saying that the, um, it's possible to overload, in my judgment, uh, what we expect public services to do. So the, because the, the, taken to its extreme, the argument would sort of run, well, if only we had perfect public services, then we wouldn't have any inequality of outcomes in education, health, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you take, for example, young children, um, even before they're born, um, the impact of their home circumstances, uh, stress on the parents, even in the womb, uh, and then actually in their uh, early years, will be a crucial determinant of their ability to form proper attachments with adults, uh, to focus their attention, to be secure, and to make relationships. And quite a lot of the work that people in early years settings are engaged in, who are just children from disadvantaged background, is compensating for those uh, problems in the early, early life. And public services can do huge amounts in that environment, but the gradient is set pretty steep. And uh, one of the important things I think Scotland has uh, uh, learned and relearned in relation to prevention is there's nothing very fancy about the things that work. So one of the things that in the uh, under fives work that's been really powerful up there at the moment is, and this is evidence-based, actually if you can get parents to read to their children before they go to sleep and manage this business, the transition from um, the day and the evening to sleep uh, in a properly and orderly way, this has hugely beneficial effects on attachment. Interestingly for the parents, as much as for the children. They feel much better in themselves. And good quality reading books are a key token. So you go into Scottish uh, uh, nursery and you'll see there'll be a run chart on the wall about here was week one and here were the number of uh, reading incidents that you know took place that week and then it's going up like this. So the teachers and the care assistants are working really hard to get that. And then it gets creative because they find that the younger sibling is interfering with the reading that's going on with the elder sister, right? And so what do they do? They provide little books for the little, to go home for the little ones so that actually can distract and engage the little ones. So they're all the time making these small adjustments in what you can do to, to work in all of that. And for me, that's really preventative because the more children who go through into formal education, uh, used to concentrating, used to warm adult relationships, the more progress that they're going to make. So that's preventive stuff for me. Daniel, what, what chances do you think we have of seeing lots of prevention in the spending review? So I, I spent the last five years um, working on with, in an organisation that's trying to fund immunisation in the 73 poorest countries of the world. And so I do, I do believe in prevention. Um, I do think it's a good, good thing to do. I think, unfortunately, not everything that seems to have a preventive effect is quite as easy to measure as the impact of vaccines. Um, and it, therefore, it's harder to make the case to a very sceptical Treasury that, uh, you know, that, it's, that it's important to invest in these things. I think there is a risk in, you know, if, the tar if you're going to try and generate a 10 billion surplus uh, by 2020, then a lot, a lot might fall by the wayside. So I, I'm, not, I'm not clear that, that this is necessarily going to be uh, a priority. It certainly isn't something that the government has, senior leadership of the government has talked very much about recently. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic, but let's see how it comes out. Paul? Tr trouble with families would be a classic preventative um, intervention, mm -hmm. would it not? Just picking up from that point and going back to the Prime Minister's speech of September the 11th, he is a believer of prevention when it comes to families policy, yeah, but um, it costs money. You've got to be able to measure the result you know, and be sure that the, re the result works. You know, how do you how do you measure that? It's going back to Adrian's question, um, and then um, 
you know, the question here is whether the Treasury, whether Osborne is going to be as keen on this in the spending review as Cameron is in the abstract. He's clearly very keen to do something like this. And part of the debate about not just trouble families policy, but families policy is precisely whether you should have family hubs that are different from children's centres where reading skills are taught and so on. But you know, my, my sense, and I may be wrong, is this is going to be a much higher priority still for, for Cameron yearning for the early Cameron years of 05, first years of his leadership, when he was much more focused on this quality of life stuff with Steve Hilton at his side, than it will be for the Chancellor looking at the um, haphazard and busy business of a spending review. We've got to make savings quickly. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we had a question just here. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, David Hodge, and I'm the leader of Surrey County Council. Not sure if I'm the only leader here. Um, but to me, a smart estate is about what are the outcomes for my residents. Do my residents feel that we're saving money for them? Do my residents feel that the services are changing and that we're working in partnership with other people? Because at the end of the day, devolution will actually help that journey. But I don't see devolution as the, as the ultimate thing. I, I think we can get devolution at local government level. Um, I hope it's done with a bit more sense than what the LEPs, the local enterprise partnerships, I do apologize to those who don't know what LEP is, um, was done because I do think devolution needs scale in terms of uh, size and in terms of geography. We, if we end up doing too small a scale, I think we will run into problems later down the line. My real question actually is, if local government can do devolution, what about central government? Who would like to pick up on that, Peter? Well, I, I, I thought this was one of the, as I mentioned, one of the most striking facets of the speech and indeed goes back to the theme that Paul has played in, I think, very importantly here about what do we know about um, the Chancellor's ambitions here and as, as I understand it, the, the, the large-scale devolution to Manchester more broadly essentially is his uh, creation and has been driven through. And I think for a number of reasons that's uh, powerful and important because I think that the um, Whitehall, in my experience now some years old, uh, tends to respond to the channels of the flow of money. So I think, it, I think if the Treasury embodies this idea and sticks with it and follows it through, then um, central government, that will pro provide the most favourable conditions I think what's interesting, and you and I would share a background in all of this, is the sort of enduring myth of government, that local government does what it's supposed to do, you know, that it's told to do. Um, because there's always that space uh, that's occupied by local leadership. So you've got a range of inputs and possibilities, and it's your job to put that together for the people of Surrey. You know, a fantastic thing. And it isn't a linear relationship of you get X from government and you give it to Y. It's a much more creative... And for government to celebrate that, that you get stronger accountability, more creativity, more energy, better leadership through devolution, that's the big reason for doing it. And I think just rather than being pressed into doing it for expenditure reasons, whatever it might have, that would be the prize for me. Daniel. So there's been a lot of talk this week about the constitution and conventions and, you know, what is a convention and how do you define it and, you know, what entrenchment has it got? And, uh, you know, that is, of course, one of the challenges you have with, a, with not having a codified constitution. And with, uh, I mean, there isn't really entrenchment in the, in, the, in the constitution. If you set something up, it can be changed by parliament, uh, you know, with, with a vote um, or with a series of votes. Um, so where does entrenchment come from? Well, in Scotland and Wales, um, there have been referendums which have entrenched devolution there. I think it would be very difficult for a new government to come into Westminster and say we're getting rid of devolution. Um, but uh, obviously it's very different with local authorities. And you know, in my career as a civil servant, I saw lots of different arrangements with local government, uh, lots of different arrangements with other bodies, NHS and the business partnerships you were talking about. And I think this, that's incredibly difficult um, because you know you you lose the continuity of of structures and people and all the rest of it. So, you know, I, I think I, I mean it is really impressive how the Chancellor has gripped this agenda, and it does seem like there is going to be more serious transfer of power than we've seen previously. And the business rates announcement—it's not clear how it's going to work, but you know that could be mm -hmm. quite significant. But the basis of it is not very solid, 
uh, a new government could come in and, and rewrite the rules again and re reorganise all the institutions. So I think that's one of the big challenges in local government is getting that entrenchment and somehow trying to fix the structures so that they've got time to grow. And your question was about scale and it was how devolution should work and at what level. And if you, as you will have done, read Cameron's and Osborne's and other ministers' speeches about devolution to cities and city, city mayors, the argument flows in this kind of way. You know, look what Boris has been able to do for London with scale. You can get investment yes. for the whole area with sort of big scale. You can join up the transport. You can have a sort of citywide look at crime. Uh, and you've been the leading person coming onto our site on Conservative Home and saying, hey, hang on a minute. I if a county has the same sort of population basis as, as a city, why shouldn't the same apply to a county or a, gr or a group of counties? And I think it's a very powerful argument. And uh, you know, if you're going to have city mayors, you know, the government is it's going to have to twist around all over the place. If it's going to find a reason not to do outside cities, what it's arguing should be done within them. And we've got time for a final round of questions. So there's a question here. And any others, have a think if you've got any last minute burning issues. Greg Rosen, I'm a consultant director of reform, so I've been in the <coughs> overflow ante room. Um, to create a smarter state isn't a vital prerequisite that the, uh, the that civil servants are able to develop sufficient expertise in the area in which they're advising on policy to be able to really genuinely give smart advice. To do that, do we not either have to ensure that we genuinely open civil service recruitment to people who know what they're doing in things like digital, etc., rather than putting people in who, 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 uh, who may not have that direct expertise, and or address the problem of churn, which has been recognized by every senior perm sec that I've come across as an as a enormous problem in that brilliant and talented people are moved too quickly and often at just the precise moment where they are uh, sufficiently knowledgeable of their patch to give that advice, they moved on to something else. Mm. Peter Johnson. Yeah, I mean, th I think the churn argument is um, uh, absolutely fundamental. And um, one of the things that uh, we sought to do in Scotland, beginning by measuring it, was to slow it down. Because it not only infuriates ministers, but also infuriates stakeholders, you know, just developing a relationship and I mean, I think we have to recognise the dynamics here often about a thin talent pool and about moving people, or your inverted commas, best people around. And one of the key things you have to do there is to broaden the talent pool. And I think your first point actually goes to this in some important way because uh, you do have to have people who are deeply knowledgeable in their area. But these days, increasingly, that means who do they know? How big is their address book and how skillful are they at deploying a different range of extra civil service expertise people out with to come in and actually engage with ministers or to be developing ideas? And I think that the best civil servants are brilliant at that. And it's about confidence, actually, of, of drawing in new perspectives and saying, we don't know, or we don't know as well as these people do. And finding people who've got the um, uh, ability and license to go out and make those kind of relationships and then to form that. So I think a smaller number of civil servants in a smarter state will have to get better and better at doing that. And government's never going to be able to pay top dollar that will, be, will get the best of everything uh, to the table. So it's going to have to be discriminating about uh, its own people, but they're going to have to get better and better at flowing expertise in. Daniel. So one of the things about the civil service, obviously, is you need these specialists. Um, and you know, very sensibly, I think John Manzoni has put a big emphasis on those, those specialisms. But you also, I mean, because departments are, in a sense, the, the sort of, they've got generalised responsibility for a, an area, a domain of, of government activity. Uh, so, you know, they're sort of at the top of the, of the, of the tree. Um, they basically have to be able to do anything that the minister wants them to do. Uh, and that's quite challenging. Um, and you need people who can be moved around quickly and, and from one minute can be setting up a new agency and then now we're going to be contracting this thing out and now, <coughs> now we're going to be writing a speech and now we're going to be doing this other thing. And, um, you know, so too much emphasis can be put on 
developing that cadre of kind of very flexible people. But actually, it is one of the things that allows the civil service to be politically neutral and to adapt to incoming administrations and so on. So you, you've got to develop these specialisms. You also have to have this generalized ability. Uh, both of these things are going to be kind of under pressure uh, as, as the civil service shrinks and the pay bill continues to be under pressure. But just, I mean, one of the things is to promote people who stay. So give people incentives to stay doing particular jobs and just change the mood music. So civil servants would often say it to you, oh, I'm due a move. And you just need to interrogate what that means. You know? <laughs> I can imagine how that interrogation might yes, go. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, but unless you actually reverse the incentives and demonstrate to people that you can grow a career through actually deep knowledge and, and producing over a number of years a solid outcome. And it is interesting that people do respond to those signals. You can change the culture quite fast if you promote these people, but not those. And people think, what's happening? Okay, we've got two final questions. Um, one right at the back of the room, and then one here. Uh, sorry. First yeah. at the back of the room, please. Carl Allen, I'm a pensioner with a bit of a sore throat. Uh, following on on the last question, when we talk about specialism and smart people, I think that has to be, what shall I say, redefined for this century. So it's not enough to say that you're a specialist and that you have a big network. That's not, not of much use in this century if you don't have a sort of broad cross-disciplinary knowledge. It's simply not enough to take the last century definition of a smart person and carry it into this century. Can we take this question as well, and then um, I'd like you to come back to those two and any final comments. Yeah. Um, Raj Patel, Understanding Society Study. Um, one of the questions we haven't really picked up and is open to any government is really to identify things that it might just want to kick into the long grass. It doesn't really have to tackle all the social problems. Um, if it thinks they're either too expensive or they might be better addressed in the next parliament. And obviously, care is an interesting one where, for instance, the Dilnot report has already been pushed back in terms of timing. So what does the panel think this government might kick into the long grass? Great. So what skill sets do we need, and what should we kick into the long grass? Daniel. Well, I agree with your point at the back about, uh, you know, clearly, clearly it's, it's right. And, and I think, um, you know, coming back to the digital government question, you need to get people from different disciplines in the room uh, to work on these issues. It's not just a question of having people who know the technology and people who know the business processes. You need to have people who understand the customers and the customers themselves in the room as well. Um, and that, that, you know, that interdisciplinary process needs to be you know, replicated whenever you're developing a new process or, or policy. Um, what's going to be kicked into the long grass? I mean, I, uh, you know, I think... Um, uh, it's very difficult to, to say beyond what I've already said, which is there are some areas that are protected and then there are lots of areas that aren't protected. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's pretty clear that, that, that many of the areas that are not protected, there's going to be a combination of explicit reductions in spending uh, or explicit announcements that things will stop, but mostly uh, things will kind of, you know, be a lower priority by a process of elimination. Peter. Well, far be it for me as somebody from Scotland who... Um, offer an opinion about what might uh, happen here. But I'd just, a, as a final comment, like to pick up uh, a point made by a colleague from the business school a couple of rows behind you. And one of the most successful things uh, Whitehall has done in the last few years has been this major project's leadership academy. Uh, not only substantively in terms of uh, the progress of major projects, but also in terms of capability. So a generation of people have been through a substantive program uh, of a couple of years duration mainline civil servants to develop their capability in managing, leading uh, large-scale projects effectively. Point, I think in the digital space something would be very interesting uh, in that arena. We'd, we did something small-scale in Scotland as a, a proof of concept, the idea that you would take some people and just expose them to uh, the digital world in lots of different ways and get them to think about its application to their work, and the, the results of that were promising, but the scale, impact, uh, longevity of the MPLA type model uh, in its partnership with the business school, I think is really worth thinking about replicating. Great, thank you. Final thoughts from you, Paul. Well, I think that they're going to mangle a lot of metaphors in the next sentence, but I think the shadow of long grass has actually hung over the whole of this discussion this evening, which is we're going into a spending review. 
um, which follows on from a manifesto, which follows on from a general election where all the main parties, to a degree, um, have protected spending that goes on older, better off, largely retired people. Uh, and you know the brunt of the adjustment is being carried by younger people who are in work, as we've seen from this week's um, row about tax credits. And although I say I've been away, I haven't been away so far as not to notice that. Um, and a really little big question as you go forward from the spending review towards 2020 is, you know, how long can politicians in the country sort of carry on squeezing the balloon here to see it bulging out there and to see the younger generation whether it's in terms of access to housing and home ownership, whether it's pension security, um, you know, or, or whether it's um, uh, being more loaded with debt than previous generations who went through higher education, and, you know, how long can that social contract continue to be pulled in the way it has? And lots of people in both the main parties have um, written and explored this. You know, David Willits actually did rather daringly in opposition when he wrote The Pinch, now able to return to it at the Resolution Foundation. But I think a really big question for the parties in the next five years is, is going to be how can they get off this hook on which they, responding to electoral pressure, are. And off the top of my head there must be one of two ways. And one is that it will all be done gradually through the devolution agenda. Uh, that's the way in which the money and the resources will be evened up. The other, which I suppose is less likely to happen, but as a journalist I've got a sort of hankering for, is to have a sort of great national conversation about affordability and about whether we can continue to skew public spending in the way it's being skewed so certain departments bear the brunt of the scale back while others are relatively protected. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to draw this to a close, but just to flag that the Institute's working on a lot of the themes that we've been talking about tonight, um, and the report that Daniel mentioned on the spending review will be out in a couple of weeks' time. So thank you very much indeed for coming. Please join us for a drink outside, but first of all, please join me in thanking our excellent panellists.